This is an overview of our discussion of Genesis chapter 1, 26 through 2, verse 3, the 5th of January, reading from the New International Version. We had three learning objectives to our discussion. First, we shall explain the plural, our image, then understand the meaning of the image of God, and thirdly, to defend the sanctity of human life. Dealing with the sixth creative day of the book of Genesis, the origin of humankind, when Elohim proposed to make human beings. Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and over all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Everyone asks, who are these us or our image? Historically, there have been several theories as to why God spoke with plural pronouns. Some say that this is a leftover of ancient mythology when they used to believe in many Elohim gods. Ignorant Christians have often thought that this refers to the Trinity, the Father and the Son, or the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. However, that doctrine did not develop until about the 3rd century CE. Others suppose that this refers to duality, stemming from Judaism's belief in two Yahwehs, whom some called God and His Word. Others imagine that this is some kind of majestic we, God talking to Himself as a great king. Others say, no, God was speaking to the creation, the earth, the sun, the moon, and the stars, saying, now let's make humankind. Others say, well, no, He is speaking to the heavenly hosts, that is, mobilizing angelic beings or more precisely, divine beings, the so-called sons of God who were present at creation. The divine beings theory derives from other scriptures, such as 1 Kings. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne with all the multitudes of heaven standing around him on his right and on his left. Or in Job, the morning stars sang together, all the angels, that is, sons of God or sons of the gods, shouted for joy. Or from Genesis chapter 3, the man has become like one of us. Or Psalm 82, I said, you are gods, you are all sons of the Most High, speaking to an assembly of angels. There are five main views of what is the image of God. Theologians suppose that God shares his attributes with us humans. He is intelligent, we are intelligent. He is loving, we can be loving. He is a creator, we are creative. Some fake religions have supposed that God is a glorified human who begets human children who may in turn become gods. The wider society will say, Humans are made by God, so should be respected, despite their race or immoral behavior. Those who appeal to mythology suppose that some humans were begotten by gods, so have special powers and privileges. Whereas those who study the book of Genesis point out that God created human beings to subdue and to rule the earthly realm as his images. <clears throat> so then, what is the image of God? The term Tselem is used elsewhere in Scripture of statues, models, images, idols, and replicas. And the term likeness, demut, is an abstract noun whose verbal root means to be like, to resemble. Humans, then, are God's imagers. God originally created humans to commune with divine beings and to rule over the new earth. 
So we might say that humans are to be God's idols. So in some poetic sense, we might say that human beings were intended to be God's idols. For even the New Testament teaches that God's Holy Spirit comes and dwells within and amongst human beings who are his temple. Still in the sixth creative day, Elohim creates humans using the verb bara. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God he created them. Male and female he created them. Thus this noun, Adam, literally the mankind, referring to the mention of mankind in verse 26. The term Adam itself is used in this context first of humankind, also as a proper name of Adam, and in his role as a male human. Thus, in Scripture, we find at least three sets of divine imagers. First, the divine council members in the supernatural realm, as in Genesis 1.26, in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule. And then, male and female human beings in the natural realm, God created mankind in his own image. And thirdly, the incarnate Son of God, he is the image of the invisible God. The title is known also in pagan sources. In both Egyptian and Mesopotamian society, the king or some high-ranking official might be called the image of God. Such a designation, however, was not applied to canal diggers or to masons who work it on a ziggurat. Well, how does this fact help to understand what the Bible is saying about humankind, that all human beings are adequate imagers of the Creator God? Questions that careful readers often pose include this. How did an intelligent God create human beings? Was it simply poof, out of nothing? Or poof, out of something? Or did everything come to pass simply with enough time plus matter plus chance, as the atheist believes by faith? Or by time plus matter plus design, as those who admit the possibility of some kind of divine designer? Others wonder, are we a mere speciation from earlier primates? Or... Was genetic modification done by extraterrestrial beings who came to Earth to develop slave labor for their mineral extractions? Or did spiritual beings somehow adopt and adapt human bodies? Some have suggested that we are degenerates from former superior beings who are now gone. And others, no, were degenerated from superior beings who are still here but are invisible, possibly traveling about in UFOs. Still dealing with the sixth creative day, in verse 28, Elohim blesses and commands the first humans. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, and over every living creature that moves on the ground. It is the blessing of God itself that granted us this rule over the earth, a rule that, admittedly, we have abused. 21st century philosophers have other views. Some consider human beings now to be redundant, that is, there are too many of us. According to philosopher Yuval Noah Harari, in the early 21st century, when we just don't need the vast majority of the population because the future is about developing more and more sophisticated technology, such as artificial intelligence and bioengineering, most people don't contribute anything to that 
except perhaps their data, and whatever people are still doing which is useful, these technologies increasingly will make redundant and will make it possible to replace the people. And then there are others who have their own answers, suggesting that human problems stem from overpopulation. So just how pressing is it to reduce global population? Some vaccine makers have publicly revealed a role for vaccines to reduce world populations by 10 to 15 percent. Others recommend and are implementing what they call terraforming, which includes reducing global agriculture by spraying sun blockers into the atmosphere. Less food will lead to a proper die-off of human beings. Others insist that we must sequester carbon. Thus, some governments have begun culling forest trees and burying them in underground carbon banks to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And then others who appeal to gender identity seek to transist children and youth so that they cannot or will not reproduce. Verses 29 to 30 teach that Elohim gave us plants as food. Then God said, I give to you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. What is this breath of life? Which in it is live nephesh. And in the next chapter, mankind became for a live nephesh. Thus, that which human beings became is also in the beasts, which thereby partake of a common nature. The preposition for in 2.7 seems to indicate that mankind became a living being without ceasing to be that which he was formed from, namely, the dust of the earth, the Adama. And in verse 31, all is very good. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus we deduce that Yahweh, the Creator, wanted a big, loving family of divine beings and of human beings, just what you and I always wanted. And he will have it, even at the cost of his beloved Son, and we shall have it too, if we remain loyal to him. By way of summary, the sky and the earth have been finished. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. The heavens and the earth, recall chapter 1, verse 1, when God undertook to make the heavens and the earth, which he had now completed, along with everything living in them. Sabaot, the plural of tzaba, just a grammatical note, the usual Hebrew masculine plural suffix is im, and the feminine plural suffix ot. So in chapter 2, verse 2, we read, By the seventh day God had finished the work he had been doing, so on the seventh day he rested from all his work. Was God tired? Did he need a rest? What further purpose was to be fulfilled by instituting a Sabbath day? The Sabbath will become a biblical symbol of everlasting life. Jesus reminded the Jews of his day that the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. So Elohim rested, that is, he ceased the work, 
and consecrated the Sabbath. Then God blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Just what does holy mean? Kalesh. When used of Yahweh himself, who is holy, this means he is holy other, having no peer, no equal. He is unique. There is not even another God like him. When used of human beings, we are to be holy as he is holy. This refers to our loyalty to Yahweh alone. We do not hold faith in multiple deities. But when used of things and places, this means that those have been dedicated to Yahweh or to his worship. Because he has finished the creation that he started in chapter 1, verse 1. Because on it, the Sabbath, he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. However, we ask, what creative work would Yahweh perform on behalf of Israel? Think about his provisions of water and food in the wilderness. What further creative work would Jesus perform during his ministry on earth? Think about his miracles of restoring life to the dead, of turning water into wine, of feeding the hungry from little. What creative further work does God perform on our behalf? Scripture declares that if anyone belongs to Jesus Christ, he or she now becomes a new creation. And then, of course, one day, all of heaven and earth are to be recreated or be made new. If you're meeting with a group, ask and discuss what one fact, insight, belief, or action that each one learned from this passage. Pray aloud, giving thanks to God for his creative mind, power, wisdom, and design. Your assignment for our next session is to read Genesis chapter 2, verses 5 through 25, each day in different Bible versions.